everybody, I welcome you again on my channel and this is the second part of the presentation Extraocular Muscles Anatomy. In this part we're going to talk about surgical anatomy of extraocular muscles and the main parameters which should be considered for extraocular muscle surgery. The size and shape of the palpebral opening should be considered at the beginning of extraocular muscle surgery. The average adult palpebral opening is 28 mm long and 10 mm high. An average 18 months old child has a palpebral opening 20 mm long and 8.5 mm high. A newborn has a palpebral opening measuring 18 mm long and 8 mm high. Of course, those parameters and diff are different from patient to patient, but those numbers are overage. Uh, for this specific age range. There are also two main palpebral fissure shapes, mongoloid and antimongoloid, depending on the relative positions of the medial and lateral canti. If the outer canti is higher than the inner cantus, then we talk about mongoloid palpebral slant. And if the outer cantus is lower than the inner cantus, then we talk about antimongoloid palpebral slant. What is important for this, uh, for, the, for this palpebral fissure shape is that it might create V pattern isotropia or A pattern isotropia. So V pattern isotropia in a patient with antimongoloid palpebral fissure and A isotropia is characteristic for patient with a mongoloid palpebral fissures. Epicontal folds is the next, next important parameter which should be considered for strabismus uh, examination. So there are telecanthus and epicanthus. Telecanthus increase the distance between the medial canti of the eyes while the interpapillary distance is normal. And epicanthus, a condition in which a fold of skin that stretches from the upper to the lower eyelid partially covers the inner canthus. Here on this slide, on the photo A, this patient demonstrates telecanthus with an interorbital dimensions clearly more than one half the interpapillary distance and also has exotropia. On the photo B, this patient with uh, epicanthus with a prominent epicanthal fold. There is also another term uh, like epicanthus inversus, a skin fold originating below and sweeping upward is called epicanthus inversus. It's pretty feasible for a patient uh, by looking down or closing uh, or when the patient close, closes uh, his eyes. Epicanthal folds covers the nasal conjunctiva in both patients here on this slide, on the, pa on the photo uh, below and above, giving the appearance of isotropia. However, the light reflex is centered in the pupil, cent is centered in the pupil in each case. A large angle kappa could hide a small manifest isodeviation. So what is angle kappa? Angle kappa is the angle which is formed by the pupillary axis and the visual axis. So angle between those two axes creates an angle kappa. And the no normal angle kappa range is between 2 to 5. When the average angle kappa is more or, or less of this normal range, then we talk about negative and positive angle kappa. A positive angle kappa is present when the visual axis is nasal to the pupillary axis and this stimulates exotropia and is very common. As you can see here on the photo, you can see a light reflex located a bit nasal and clinically it gives a feeling of exotropia. However, this is not a real exotropia, this is a simulated or pseudo exotropia. And, uh, when we talk about negative uh, angle kappa, it's a vice versa condition when the pupil light located temporally and simulates isotropia. Conjunctiva. Of course, conjunctiva is very important. Uh, conjunctival estimation is very important before starting the surgery. So we know about the uh, conjunctiva 
the area of limbus, the plica simulonaris and the caruncul and the caruncul. And of course, plica simulonaris and the caruncul is very important to keep the morphological structure of those conjunctival parts, especially during the surgery on medial rectus. Tenon capsule. It comes right after conjunctiva. So here on this photo, the muscle hook is placed in a hole created in the intermuscular membrane adjacent to the muscle insertion and glides along bare sclera behind the rectus muscle insertion and is exposed and the opposite muscle border with a snip incision. So here we can see a muscle hook, anterior tenons capsule which comes right after conjunctiva and posterior tenons capsule with intermuscular membrane. Surgical anatomy of the rectus muscles. So just before that, we were talking about the main parameters which should be considered for the extraocular muscle surgery. Before, as you give the description of a patient, if the patient has pseudostrobismus due to epicantal folds, or if the patient has pseudostrobismus due to angle kappa, or uh, mongoloid structure uh, of the eye uh, or anti-mongoloid. So this is very important to write down in a patient's chart or once you being as a resident give the information of the patient to your supervisor during your strabismus rotation. So all those parameters should be considered. As for surgical anatomy of the rectus muscles, this is all about numbers because we know that strabismus surgery is all about numbers. We have to count how much uh, to recess, how much to reject, how much uh, transposition upward, downward. So it's all about numbers. But of course, we have to remember that all those numbers are different from patient to patient. There, it is not a mathematic. Sometimes we can see absolutely different picture during the surgery and um, we have to change our plans based on this specific patient and this specific case we have uh, at that moment. So here, but those numbers of course are very important because this is just an average number of normality and uh, as you can see here on the photo the furthest muscle is a superior rectus muscle and the closest muscle to the limbus is a medial rectus muscle. And uh, on the photo is pretty visible the spiral of tilaux and the relationship of the re uh, rectus muscles insertion. And on this slide we can see another measurements of rectus muscles and the widest muscles is a superior rectus uh, muscle and the, uh, the less width is a lateral rectus muscle. Surgical anatomy of inferior oblique. The inferior oblique behaves uh, as if it had two potential regions and two potential insertions because of its union with Lockwood's ligament as it passes beneath the inferior rectus muscle. So what is Lockwood ligament? The ligament of Lockwood could be compared to a hammock supporting the globe. The inferior oblique passes beneath the inferior rectus, as I said already, through Lockwood's ligament and orbital fat approximately 12 to 14 millimeters from the limbus. And the inferior fat pad is prominent and should not be disturbed during surgery of the inferior rectus. That's why while you having uh, inferior uh, oblique surgery, it's really important to have a good assistant during the surgery who can provide you a good conjunctival opening and let you and make it possible for you to catch the inferior oblique just in one go without having any risk of uh, fat explosion or rupturing the neighbor's tissue which can cause a disturb distortion of uh, fat uh, in that area. Surgical anatomy of superior oblique. The superior oblique tendon is redirected to 54 degree from the frontal plane, uh, from the frontal plane and passes posteriorly and temporally beneath the superior rectus. And the superior oblique remains attached to the superior rectus when the rectus is detached and pulled up. This you can see on the photo below, this white and black photo, when you can see a pulled up a superior rectus muscle and still attached uh, superior oblique muscle. As uh, for inferior oblique muscle, uh, 
as it has also a lock with ligaments, there is also a ligament for superior oblique muscle, but it calls Whitnell's ligament. The relationship of Whitnell's ligament and the superior oblique tendon is also very important. Blind hooking the superior oblique tendon can damage Whitnell ligament and can cause apoptosis after surgery. Whitnell ligament uh, acts like a clothesline with orbital structure suspended and this is a sample uh, of a case when the Whitnell ligament was damaged during the surgery and caused the ptosis on the right eye. Trochlea. Uh, the trochlea is uh, another part of superior oblique muscles and attached to the medial orbital wall with the tendon entering and exiting. And here on this slide, there are a few photos where you can clearly define the trochlea. Here are the dimensions of the trochlea with sagittal and coronal and its specific parameters. And there is a CT scan photo. So CT scan showing trochlea on the left and no trochlea on the right eye. And on the photo B is the same patient demonstrating the superior oblique muscle on the right and no muscle on the, right, uh, on the left. And this is another sample where gaze positions showing overaction of the right inferior oblique and underaction of the right superior oblique. So about underaction and overaction, I will uh, talk in the future presentations when I will describe the motility of extraocular muscles. So this, as I said already, uh, overaction of the right inferior oblique, it's pretty visible when the patient looks to the side, and underaction of the right superior oblique. And during the surgery, there is an absence of the right superior oblique, which was confirmed. So we never know what is going to happen during the surgery and which picture we're going to see during the surgery. And this was the second part of the presentation, extraocular muscles anatomy. We're going to continue with the third part where I will talk about vessel supply of eye muscles, vortex veins and sclera. So stay tuned, subscribe to my channel. I hope you find this video informative for you. I'm wishing you a good day. Bye.